Uh, NVIDIA joined the $1 trillion valuation big boys club. Sorry, gamers. Uh, and I alluded to this earlier. Right on the heels of their launch of the RTX 4060, where gamers were up in arms, uh, gaming media is up in arms over how uh, you know awful the 4060 is from a competitive standpoint, how awful it is from a uh, last gen to current gen upgrade standpoint. And then their stock jumps, you know, 25% the following day. They briefly hit a $1 trillion valuation. Um, this is alongside Al Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and uh, Saudi Aramco, which I don't know how to pronounce, but there you go, oil company. Um, they're the first chip maker to touch the $1 trillion mark thanks to massive demand for AI processors. That is what it is all about i think you nailed it i think it was last wan show when you were saying like I, I think they're not being price competitive on this gpu because they just didn't dedicate a lot of like manufacturing to it like i think that's it i think it, why be price competitive when we don't even like we don't even have a ton of them because we want those lines to be dedicated towards other things here's the thing i i don't i don't know if i was right anymore I think it's a combination of things. Um, they they went to an aggressive new process node that is more expensive and does have lower yields compared to what AMD is able to do with their lower end cards. Uh, the 7600 was the most recent one. And I had a meeting with NVIDIA at the show that I, I guess I should talk about, right? I don't know if any of it was on the record, so <laughs> hopefully this is all kosher. But uh, anywho, basically the... Here's what I think. And this is not anything that anyone at NVIDIA said. This is just what I think from talking to some of the NVIDIA folks, from seeing what's going on with them on a business level, I think they should split up. I think they should spin off GeForce. Interesting. Because talking to the folks at NVIDIA who do work on the GeForce team, looking at the kinds of unnecessary innovations that they are still bringing to gaming. Uh, so they announced uh, a new ultra low motion blur technology that- They've announced a few things. Recently, yeah, actually. yeah, that they, they claim gets to something I think is like 1600 Hertz motion clarity or something like that. It feels, it feels very, <sighs> because we can make it a little bit better, you know, and and that's especially true to me because we have display technologies coming down the pipe that are going to make that level of better image persistence on LCD totally unnecessary, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm looking at it going, yeah, these guys in the lab are, 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 are really trying to crush it here for gamers. And in some ways, I feel like they're kind of getting held back by the expectations that NVIDIA, the organization's shareholders have for profitability. Because GeForce is always gonna be a consumer brand with consumer margins, right? Whereas NVIDIA's data center business or their AI business for, for automotive, right? Or their... Um, you know, embedded products business, like all of these, anything that's B2B is inherently going to have more margin because your customer is making money on it. Like a new GPU is a burden because all of a sudden there's all these new games that you couldn't play before that now it's time to buy and play. Yeah, and I don't yeah. mean a burden personally. I mean a financial burden, yeah, yeah. right? You're not, outside of mining, you're not making money on it. But but that's a really important point to make because mining is such a great example of how when something makes you money, all of a sudden, even if you are an actual gamer, you're willing to pay so much more for it because it helps offset the cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So the kinds of margins that NVIDIA can make on something like a gray super chip are going to look really attractive to their shareholders and the kinds of margins they can make on some... RTX 4060, even if it seems completely unreasonable to you and to me, are going to look really unattractive. And as the proportion of this business shrinks 
on the gaming side and grows on the data center side, their shareholders are going to look at them and go, hey, guys, um, what are you doing? Yeah. Are, are you Should you even be making consumer GPUs anymore or shipping all the silicon, all the wafers you can get from TSMC or Intel for that matter? That's going to be interesting. Jensen said their next gen manufacturing node is looking good. Should you just be booking all of it for AI and completely ignoring gaming? And I don't think NVIDIA wants to. That's what I wanted to say is I think the GeForce team really wants to build great gaming experiences. And I feel like they're a little bit hamstrung right now. I, I have for quite a while now. I, I assume you've kind of felt the same thing. You know, when you used to go to NVIDIA.com and the like main thing was drivers? GeForce drivers yeah. specifically. Yeah. Now, like, even if you go to geforce.com, which just redirects to nvidia.com slash geforce, um, there's, there's like the geforce section, but then there's another banner above that, just like making sure that you don't forget that there's a separation between geforce and nvidia, yep. and you can go to the main menu of for that, nvidia.com, which has nothing to do with geforce. Even when you're on the specific geforce page, they're like, just in case you didn't mean to be here, we've got you. Product solutions, industries for you whatever that means yeah. yeah like it's i have always felt kind of weird about the nvidia site for a while now and because of that reason and this really ties into what i was talking about before where it used to be that the innovations that nvidia would build for their data center products would benefit gamers mm -hmm. would make their way down to gamers yeah but we've actually seen over actually wow i guess the last couple of generations uh volta was an was uh, an example of an Nvidia chip that was built specifically not for gamers, um, and then Hopper, I I as far as I can tell, is simply not for gamers at all. It just it just doesn't have it it just doesn't have functional units you need for gaming uh, because it's laser focused on AI, right? Um, and wow. so we're not gonna we're not gonna necessarily benefit from that that r d money that comes from enterprise customers and goes towards building a bigger better gpu that ultimately gamers also get to kind of tag along with right and so i th yeah i i i would i don't know if i would like to see it but it i think it sense. i think it could make sense yeah. for nvidia to just say yeah this is a spin-off business it's geforce they they sort of they 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 buy innovation from Nvidia. Essentially, they're they're a customer of Nvidia, uh, in the same way that uh, a Nintendo would be a customer of Nvidia for the mm. processor and the Switch. And the GeForce team is laser focused on building you know great drivers, uh, building great technologies to leverage the hardware from Nvidia. Obviously, they'd work very close together, but then they wouldn't have the burden of needing to make those same margins and they could get scrappier and they could they could take the fight to AMD and as Intel ramps up with Battle Mage and Celestial, their upcoming architectures, um, I think they could be more competitive because at the end of the day, right, every fanboy has gotta understand you don't want one to win. Yeah, yeah. Ever. That's not good. Whether we're talking the big three, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, every single one of them has shown again and again and again that in the absence of of comp 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 <laughs> I'm very tired. In the absence of competition, stagnation the happens. first thing they'll do is stop refreshing products and ramp up the price. Yeah. Let's look for recent examples from each one. Shall we play a game? Sure. Do you want to go first or shall I go first? Uh, Intel pre-AMD's resurgence in the like, what would that have been? Like five, 6,000 series well, range? Well, this number, this number is key. Four? Four. Okay. How many I'm cores guessing. did you get? Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Four four cores forever was was that was a very long term. Thing. That, that ought to be all anyone needs, Lee. <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, that's a perfect example. And then if we look to AMD, the second Intel didn't have an HEDT, 
a high-end desktop competitor. AMD simply stopped bothering releasing new Threadrippers, regardless of the commitments that they had already made, not just to their enthusiast and gamer customers, but to buyers of the STRX 40 or whatever it was called, their, their last socket, their Ryzen 3000 Threadripper socket. They were just like, eh. It was basically done. There were samples out there. They just decided, yeah. Why bother? Threadripper Pro is more profitable. And this is why- So why bother? This is why for years, as we've been rooting for AMD to push really hard, we've also been pointing out that they're not like, you know, the like magically benevolent good guys. There was that campaign that they ran a while ago where they had people with like uh, protest signs at PAX and stuff. Do you remember that? No. Oh man. I, I don't think I, I saw that. It sounds cringe though. I don't remember the name of the campaign. It sounds cringe. Uh, it, it was like resist, like resist AMD's or resist Intel's whatever. I wonder if I can find it. I think it's probably been like too long and looking up anything that has to do with protest is just going to come up with a lot of news articles. So I think, I don't think I'm going to find it, but yeah, at, at like PAX West back in the day, I remember there being like genuine paid actors with protest signs that had like, like resist blah, 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 blah. And it was all AMD branding and it was all about like buy AMD to resist Intel. It's like, uh, yeah, you guys would do the same thing. <laughs> yep. I do want you to do better because competition is good, but yeah, it doesn't. Okay. Doesn't so then help. the last one is NVIDIA. NVIDIA, I honestly feel like hasn't sat on their laurels as much in a technological sense as the other brands, but they have definitely taken advantage of what they can extract cost wise yeah. as much as possible. Yep. I mean, with them, in some ways, they're just kind of smarter about it. Because they're definitely doing it. And we talked about this when we did our tier list for the best GeForce GPUs. Which, by the way, I know I often ask you, have you watched the video? I know the answer is no. You should watch this one. I skipped through and watched the 8000 series because I like cared about that. You know how many people did that? <laughs> Was it a lot? <laughs> the uh, Well, not the 8000 series specifically, but the the... The retention chart on it's that video like is super weird. We actually had a debate <laughs> internally before we started working on it for when we should start because we didn't start at the beginning. And we could have because the oh, it, there were okay. only a, a few generations of GeForce GPUs before the starting point. And we didn't start later. So it was actually pitched to me that we start more um, like like way way more recently, I, I forget I forget what the what the push was, but way more recently and and do do far fewer of them, and I picked FX, and I forget why. I think the rationale that I provided was it was right. It was the first DirectX nine GPU, and I think this is just my own personal biases. Because for me, PC gaming really started to get, you know, visually really good looking oh, wow. with DirectX 9. And looking back at it, I think it was just my own personal, that's when I got into gaming. And so we see that in the retention graph for this video, how many people got into gaming with 900 series and 10 series. Yeah. Basically, everything earlier is like, eh, skip, 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 skip. Yeah. Oh, what about this one that I bought that I'm really passionate about or that's still in my gaming rig right now and I love this thing. I've been using it for years. Isn't that hilarious? Just how few people that's cared. That's actually wild. These spikes are so, wow. Yeah, really extreme. I've never seen anything quite like this. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, anywho. What was, I what was I talking about again? Right. So with NVIDIA, it's been more of a slow boil. And we talked about it a fair bit here, where starting with the 600 series, this, this history is really important to understand when you look at NVIDIA's pricing strategy and you want to kind of get a better idea of where they're going in the future. So starting with 600 series, 
And okay, NVIDIA has code names for their GPUs. And I hate that the word GPU has come to mean graphics card because they are not the same thing. A GPU is a graphics processing unit and it's a chip. A graphics card is a board that contains a GPU, VRAM, power delivery, display outputs, okay? So the GPUs, they have code names for these, and typically they will have the uh, a letter to indicate the architecture, like GK would be GeForce Kepler, or GA would be GeForce Ampere, okay? So they have a letter, and then they have a number. And that number, the final digit, the lower that digit is, so if it's a zero, that is going to be the largest chip for that series. If it's a two, that's going to be a smaller one. If it's a four, smaller, six, smaller. I'm trying to remember how high they've gone in the past. But the point is, the higher that number goes, the smaller the actual die is. So sometimes you'll see two GeForce GPUs that have, let's say one has 5,000 CUDA cores and one has 4,000. But if you dig into, you know, the Tech Power Up GPU database or something like that, you'll find that they're both using the same chip. Well, some of those functional units might have been, some of those CUDA cores might have been uh, damaged in manufacturing, or they might have just been turned off to hit a lower power profile or to, to, to create segmentation between two products so that, you know, this one doesn't perform too close to the other one. But other times you'll see that two products are using completely different dies because there's only so many CUDA cores on a die, even if it's perfect. And it only makes so much sense to cut them down before that's just a, a, a broken product and the power profile wouldn't make any sense for this you know, more budget oriented product. So that's why you design these different sizes of dies. Finally getting there, um, with Kepler, that was the first time we saw NVIDIA launch a flagship 80 series GTX you know, product, a top tier product with not the top tier die. Now we had seen before a top tier die, but with, no, it wasn't the first time. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about that other one later. Um, we had seen not a top tier die, uh, or we had seen a top tier die, but not all of it. So a slightly right. cut down one. And yeah. that, would, that would be due to yields, right? They, they just couldn't get enough fully working ones to make it economically viable. But we hadn't seen them launch a flagship GPU with a, with, with a cut down, with a not top tier die. And then we didn't get big Kepler until 700 series. So we got Kepler and then we got Kepler again, something we, again, I don't think had actually seen in the past, but that's with an asterisk because the 9,000 yeah. 9, series was a little bit more complicated where 8,000 series was awesome, G80. So that's eight, zero. So that was a big die, was the 8800 GTX and the 8800 Ultra, was uh, kind of usurped by G92, which was uh, a shrunk and just like way more efficient, even though it was smaller, um, die. So the 8800 GT came out and kind of made the GTX look pointless from a cost perspective. And then they tweaked that and released the 9800 GTX, which was not a big die, but there wasn't a big die version. It was just a, it was just a, a really weird time for, for NVIDIA because they couldn't innovate as easily as they had been able to before that because they couldn't just keep shrinking the manufacturing process. That was kind of where we started to ask the question, is Moore's Law dead? Uh, you know, is GPU innovation going to slow down in a big way? And, and it has. And that's the same thing where I'm talking about them boiling the frog in terms of slowing things down. There were definitely times when they could have probably pushed harder, but started stretching, you know, how long a GPU generation should stick around for from, you know, I mean, they were, they were launching new stuff like eight, 10 months after say, like previous generations sub one year windows for a bit there. And then it went to a yearly cadence and then it went to, well, I mean, 18 months is fine, right? Two years, two years seems okay. By the way, I found it. It was called the AMD uprising campaign. The Silence whole thing was the about, GPU. like joining the rebellion and hashtag better red and stuff. It's, uh, it was, it was a weird campaign. I, I did not like it. <laughs> 